thank you very much for uh, the for the introduction. I think I, I don't think I have to say more. So my name is Sebastian Müller. I'm a member of the Institute for Mediterranean Studies, and I'm prehistoric archaeologist. And this is also, uh, I guess, um, explaining um, the title of my talk: uh, Digitizing the Past, Archaeology and T. Um, because somehow I wanted to point out that um, archaeology is not just humanities. Um, but then I, I don't know, after thinking again about it, I, I found it's maybe not that smart as I initially thought. So you can also replace it with digital humanities or whatever. Okay. And um, I have actually uh, two, two things I would like to talk about um, here. So first of all, I would like to give a very, very brief introduction into what archaeology actually is, where the data is coming from, right? Because what we need is data, right? In the, uh, in the digital era for communication, all we need is good data. So where is the data and archaeology coming from? And what is archaeology, archaeology doing with this data already when it comes to digital tools? So this is one part. And then in the second part, I would like to introduce a few of my uh, projects where I use some digital tools. You will see it is actually not that sophisticated at the moment, but I'm planning in the future with the uh, ongoing projects that I have to include this a little bit more. And you will also see that, of course, uh, since the data that I have uh, can be different from, for, I don't know, for instance, text mining and this kind of stuff. So um, yeah, some, some of the things, some of the, the outcome uh, will be different and also some of the methods. All right. So first of all, what is archaeology? You know, very briefly, um, archaeology is the study of uh, the ancient and recent human past through material remains. Archaeology analyzes the physical remains of the past in pursuit of a broad and comprehensive understanding of human culture. And this is actually probably also already pointing a little bit in uh, only humanities. Yeah? So when we analyze the material remains, they have, of course, particular properties that can be also um, approached from the natural sciences. And we are doing this all the time. The other part is a broad and comprehensive understanding of human culture means we are actually really interested in everything that is related to human beings to human life in the past. And um, since we have the material remains, um, we can, we can, of course, only uh, try to figure out things that is somehow reflected in the material culture. So, uh, you know, when we look at this, uh, then could say, we have the humanities, we have the natural sciences, and something in between is archaeology. And then it depends a little bit on the focus of each uh, researcher, you know, where they would actually somehow put the focus more. Archaeology is generally um, a subject that is really drawing from all the other disciplines. And it wouldn't exist if there weren't other disciplines that develop particular uh, methods and uh, approaches. So we are just adopting that. We are stealing that and adopting that, trying to use it in uh, our field on uh, the things that we have. So for instance, you know, if you look here uh, in, the, in the lower part of the slide, there is, um, it's a necklace. It's made of amber. It belongs to the Bronze Age in, um, in the Aegean Sea area, to the Mycenaean civilization. And, you know, from the nature of science perspective, we could say, uh, we can describe particular properties, we can analyze the material. So this is ember, that's a fossil resin that uh, has a particular points of origin. Very often, this kind of resin is coming from the Baltic Sea area. So it means they, there must have been some kind of contact between the Mediterranean and uh, northern areas in Europe. Uh, the, the ember can also come from other places, but this is exactly what uh, natural scientific methods would tell us then. Yeah, and this is then a kind of piece of information that I take and include in my interpretation. Um, natural scientific methods uh, can tell us uh, something about the age of particular materials, not so, not so much about uh, uh, the, this particular ember here, but you know, if you think about bones or something like that, so we have uh, carbon-14 analysis, uh, where it is possible to get some estimation about the age, for instance, uh, of particular artifacts or pieces of human beings or animals and so on. 
nature science can tell us something about the technology, how something was produced and so on. And on the other side, the humanities uh, part is then a consideration who was actually the owner of this uh, object here. Yeah? To which kind of culture does it belong? What is actually the meaning? What did this kind of object do in this particular society where it uh, was displayed maybe and where it was um, also um, produced? So it's a mix. This is my point. Yeah, It's uh, mixing stuff together and um, so there is data that we can use in archaeology. And maybe the, the main question is, uh, where is this data coming from? So maybe you have some kind of perception on archaeology, you know, what archaeologists do. Uh, I don't know, fighting through the jungle, going into some temple, taking a very specific artifact out and putting it then in the museum. And this is maybe um, something that was at the very beginnings of the discipline. Uh, that it was more focused on particular things, on uh, some objects that were then just put uh, placed in some collection as a kind of curios curiosity, as an exotic item or something like this. But I would say since the beginning of uh, archaeology as an academic discipline, depending on the area which we are talking about, maybe 100 to 120 years ago, there's also the idea that we can use these objects to tell something about the people who use that. Um, so the main uh, way of, or maybe one of the most uh, popular and famous ways of getting data in archaeology is, of course, uh, doing excavations. And um, the thing is, an excavation is producing really masses of data. One reason is because an excavation is actually a kind of uh, planned and uh, controlled destruction of a site. The best thing is actually not to excavate anything, to be honest, yeah? because then we kind of preserve the things, they are protected uh, in the earth and they can maybe also um, stay there for another hundred or thousand years or something like that. Um, but if we do an excavation, then there is actually the need to document everything as meticulous as possible so that other people who didn't participate at this excavation can get an overview, can get some kind of idea what was going on there. So you have to describe the environment, you have to measure everything, uh, you know, GPS. So uh, everything has to be really clear uh, where things were found. Where did you make some kind of like pit, a trench or something like that, right? And then you're going uh, through different kinds of layers. Each layer has to be described meticulously and everything that is coming has to be documented. So I'm, for instance, interested in the Bronze Age. Let's say I'm, uh, I want to make an excavation at a place uh, which was also occupied in later times, let's say in the Roman period and medieval times. So I cannot say I don't care about these upper layers there. So when I dig into this, I have to document also the structures and everything from the upper layers until I get to the ones that are interesting for me. So all of this is producing masses and masses of data in the end. And it was already so at the beginning uh, of archaeology when um, the excavators didn't really uh, had an understanding, of course, what kind of things are really uh, important or not. So the idea is really to record and document, uh, document everything as meticulous as possible. So it's, it's almost a kind of forensic uh, science yeah, that is here because it's really each detail can be important. We don't know which detail. Yeah? So maybe one colleague has a completely different research question and is interested in a particular thing. And um, so he or she is searching through my um, documentation and maybe can find that, but they can only find it if I also record recorded everything that is there, even though it is maybe not so much of interest for my particular research question. And this is also one of the reasons why um, excavations or archaeological research can take quite some time. Mm. And um, yeah, so it's, it's full of data. Then we also have um, other methods which produce quite a lot of data um, without digging. So it's, for example, making surveys, just uh, picking up uh, finds from the surface. It's also aerial photography. So you can see that on the upper uh, right side of the slide. So this is, um, you know, that you can actually recognize structures just by looking from above. So this is an older 
uh, method. And then a little bit more recent one is, for example, using ground penetrating radar, GPR. And this is the result of that you can see on the lower right side. So this is actually a Roman city. And uh, so we can actually uh, recognize some streets and blocks and everything and everything without digging there. And sometimes that's already enough just to know there is something and what it is. Uh, sometimes this is the base then for maybe um, an excavation, of course. So to find exactly the spot to excavate, um, which is maybe interesting for my particular research question. Um, and it goes, of course, uh, into the into the details. Uh, so this is here um, a grave from a quite famous one in Phylos, uh, also in the Aegean Sea in Greece, um, the so-called Griffin Warrior, also from the Bronze. And here we could get information or we would get information about like the actual structure of the tomb where is it located what is inside each of these objects again gives some data gives some information then we have the bones here natural science is coming again into play right because based on the bones they could say um is it a male is it a female um is it what age uh, was the person when he or she died um are there any kind of visible traces maybe of a particular disease on the bones um, the genetic code is possible to analyze. It's also possible to determine where people were coming from by taking uh, samples from the teeth, from the inner part of the teeth, uh, of the, the strontium isotopes, which are there. So this is, these are all kind of like sciences in itself. Yeah. And all of these kind of contribute then. Uh, so I wouldn't do that. If I excavate this kind of tomb, I would ask uh, different people um, who are experts in these fields to give me their um, assessment and then I would bring all these kind of uh, data together and try to make an interpretation based on that. So we have masses of data. Um, when it comes to archaeology and the digital humanities, so there is some overlap, there is a kind of discipline or a particular branch in archaeology that is called digital archaeology and in digi digital archaeology there's also um, uh, I don't know, some sub branches, computational archaeology, and something like this. So, archaeology has a long tradition in using tools and methods from other disciplines. And uh, I would actually say it's also an early adopter of digital methods uh, or tools. Um, so, when do we use it? Uh, for example, for digitization of artifacts and excavation data, uh, very important. Then, also for the visualization of sites and structures mapping uh, sites and artifacts distributions, um, GIS-based analysis, uh, statistical analysis, and also network analysis, and there are even more. So I will give you um, a short overview of some of the use cases here, but this is by no means exhaustive in any way. There are so many projects going on and uh, so many uh, tools are being developed and uh, so, I, I simply do not have the full overview, but just to let you know, there is really a lot of stuff going on. Okay, so uh, I will, um, you know, just talk about a few use cases and I will also uh, maybe give some recommend, uh, recommendation about some software that is there. So we heard uh, already R is something uh, that is being used quite a lot and um, I will, uh, which is also FOSS, by the way, yeah, so this is the point I will uh, mention here, basically free and open source software, uh, or at least free software. So in some cases, maybe not open source, but it's, at least it's free. And um, I mean, if you work with R or, or maybe with other um, kind of, maybe with Python also, huh, which is also quite uh, famous in um, data science and so on, um, I mean, this is really nice and you can do many things with that, but maybe let's say you're someone like me who uh, has not so much time also to focus on these kind of things, so has not so much time to learn particular tools. So I will show you just some uh, alternatives which are out there and which are maybe a little bit easier to use. Okay, so when it comes to um, the data, right? So the, the idea is we have a lot of data and we have to do something with that. We have to preserve it in such a way that other people have access to it. And of course, we also want to have data in such a way that we can somehow do something that we can analyze it, that we can interpret something. 
So using databases or making databases and bringing all this stuff together is actually um, a very old thing in archaeology. Um, and of course, there is a lot of software outside. Uh, you can use uh, the typical Office application, Access, uh, Excel, and so on, and uh, all of the whatever you like, right, is okay. Um, there's just one thing I would like to um, maybe point your attention to because I think it's a cool tool, uh, which is uh, there for free. It's called AP Info. And now here it comes. Archaeology is um, taking stuff from other disciplines a lot. This is actually from the medical world, okay? AP Info is, uh, is a kind of package for, as you can see, for collecting data, for making statistical calculations, and also for analyzing the data, um, actually for medical experts. So it's the idea there is an outbreak, there is a contagious disease, and people have to um, record this kind of, uh, you know, the incoming uh, information very quickly. And you also have to build something very quickly. And this is actually the point for me. I don't have so much time uh, for getting into uh, things. So for me, whatever allows me to do stuff very fast is very welcome. And um, AP Info, in my opinion, is uh, specifically interesting for, for instance, building this kind of, um, nah, where's my pointer here? Um, these kind of uh, forms uh, for entering data. So if you have a big data set, I don't know, like, um, 10,000 entries or so, of course, you could just uh, open your spreadsheet and your table and type everything inside, but this is um, not really best practice. Huh? There is a lot of mistakes you can make. So actually it's better if you have a big data set to enter all the data through a form. And you can build forms with everything, with Excel, with Access, of course, also with uh, Google Sheets and what it is all called. But this one is quite nice because it offers um, a number of I would say easy, easy functionality. I mean, you also have to learn that uh, this particular tool, you can map with this already. Uh, you can make dashboards, you can uh, include imagery. Again, this is also possible with other software, no problem, but here it is offering that. And uh, for archeology, span where the visual part is very important, I need to see the artifacts to get to uh, some own understanding. So I found that's quite nice. I haven't used it in uh, my own project yet. I just, uh, it around a little bit with that and uh, I will uh, I, maybe in our next meeting okay I will tell you how, how the feeling is and if that uh, is really nice or not so just a recommendation. Um, archaeology is uh, from the very beginning also used mapping a lot yeah because mapping artifacts because a lot of uh, um, the data from archaeology is spatial data you can uh, put it in a particular location so it is the finding site, like on a bigger map, huh? and it's also in a particular feature. Let's say we have a settlement and we have several houses, so you can map um, different things between the houses to figure out if there's, uh, you know, if there are different activity zones or something like this. And you can, of course, also map within a house, for instance, or you can map within a grave. So having software that allows that is, of course, uh, something that um, is very welcome in archaeology. In the good old days, like uh, what you see on the left side, people would have a template of a map, and then they would sit there with some kind of like patterns and, you know, make these little symbols here, very tedious, and also yeah, prone, uh, uh, error prone if you don't find the right location. But today, this is no problem. You can do this in a very short time if you have the uh, geolocation. And there is a lot of software outside. I like a lot QGIS because it is very accessible. There's another one, Grass GIS, which is a little bit more tricky because you have to, uh, at least in my opinion, you have to work a little bit with the command line. So that's maybe not uh, everyone's thing, but QGIS is really um, a lot of clicking and you find a lot of tutorials out there. It is, again, it's a tool you have to uh, get into a little bit, but if you wanna do something, you wanna make a nice map, for instance, a uh, nice topographic map, um, a 3D model uh, of a particular landscape, and then put the information of your database like onto this map. This is very easy, and you can make a lot of other analysis as well. They come out of the box or they're there as plugins. This is the nice thing about FOSS because people in the community contribute uh, with particular tools. Um, so then uh, archaeology is um, also heavily drawing from geology. Huh? In geology, we have all these different layers uh, in earth history and inside we have fossils. And these fossils allow for the reconstruction of um, yeah, the earth history and the environment and so on. In archaeology, we have um, these layers um, made by human beings. And also in these layers are different artifacts. And there's, uh, of course, also different methods how to analyze that to get some feeling of 
um, here in this case, you know, what is in fashion at the particular time and what is uh, getting out of fashion. So you would use um, kind of statistical programs for that. Um, in the good old times, people would even do this by hand, yeah, as you can see here. So each uh, stripe here is actually a kind of unit, let's say a grave, uh, that would be um, a row. And then we have the columns, you know, would be put together to see that you get some kind of continuous development. And the idea is that the upper part is older and the lower part is younger or the opposite. So for this kind of purpose, um, there is something that is, was developed in um, like yeah, geology, paleontology, past uh, uh, as a software package that allows for, you have a spreadsheet, you know, just import it, maybe you have some Excel file, you import it there. And then you can quickly make a lot of interesting um, statistical uh, analysis without typing anything. You just check a few boxes and so on, and you have a nice output. It's there for free. It's a very small, lightweight. So I can just recommend, you know, if you have any kind of data uh, that you want to put in some timeline or whatever, you want to check that, or you want to also figure out some grouping of data, um, this is um, a good. A good place to go and to see uh, if it works for you. Then network analysis is used in archaeology a lot. Uh, so Gephi, for instance, is a very popular software here. And uh, so this is spatial. Uh, on one side, you can make it on a spatial level. Uh, on the other side, you can also make it yeah, just a more kind of abstract network um, or whatever use cases you like. Um, then um, 3D um, scanning, uh, photogrammetry, all these kind of things are very important for documenting sites, for instance, also documenting particular um, artifacts, objects, and hopefully in the near future, there will be databases where I just can go inside and they can see the artifact without like having it in my hands, but I'm able to turn around and, and to have uh, to get the own impression of what is going on there. And these kind of 3D uh, scannings uh, and visualizations also that take place here are not only important for um, showing what is there, it is also actually quite interesting and important uh, to learn something, right? Because we can, based on that, we can somehow get an understanding how people felt, for instance, if they would walk through a particular city or so, because you can just reconstruct it on a 3D uh, level. Uh, this brings me to another use case. Uh, it is not uh, very common yet, but I think it has big potential using, for instance, um, engines that are used for making games, video games, but instead of making video games, you make actually a kind of visualization of a particular site. So you can walk around, you maybe can also do particular um, activities. So this is uh, Unity and the other one is Unreal, two of the big market uh, players in the market. They are not, uh, completely free, but uh, for non-commercial projects, and specifically if you don't make a lot of money, they are completely free. So I think this is um, um, yeah, an interesting field, maybe for the future, also when it comes to serious uh, games or something like that. Uh, here, the problem is only that one person cannot do a lot. I mean, when you see uh, the visual, I mean, it's possible to build up some things very quick, also like from the real world, yeah, putting, uh, GIS data, for example, into Unreal and then building um, everything like a 3D model. But of course, you need further assets and that takes some time to make. And I guess one person alone, um, you need to have a team for this. Then um, like deep learning, all these kind of things are also um, used in archaeology or at least it's explored how they can be used. As an archaeologist, for instance, I have to recognize different kind of artifacts. And the idea is that you can maybe train uh, a, a network, an, uh, what is it, computational network, to recognize these artifacts and to classify them. Mm -hmm. And this is a quite recent one here, in, even published in Nature. Yeah, so um, a group of uh, scholars actually trained uh, a CNN, a convolutional neural network, to um, recognize particular artifacts from particular periods. And the thing is, um, so this is the expert performance here in one of these um, tables. And each expert is actually very good in the field they're experts in, right? So they're usually in archaeology, it's like this, you're not expert in all these different kinds of periods that exist from the beginning of humanity until, I don't know, the recent past. You have to specialize yourself, like I try to specialize in Bronze Age and Iron Age. 
and I can uh, understand and recognize the artifacts from this time, hopefully. Um, but the network is actually able to perform very well for all periods here. So it's actually, you know, uh, similar or even outperforming the experts in this case. So this is uh, interesting stuff and uh, in the future, uh, a lot of uh, things are to be expected. And then also something I just stumbled across recently, depth map X. So if you're dealing with um, data, like let's say an architecture or city plans or something like this, and you want to get some understanding how people are moving around there and everything. So you could use that. It's also not very complicated. Yeah, and it's uh, using particular, also particular algorithms to determine uh, if a particular space is well connected uh, compared to others. And again, for me as an archaeologist, this is interesting information because we are interested in all the aspects of human uh, interactions and so on. And uh, yeah, so I would definitely also use that in one of my future projects, I guess. So with this being uh, said, I just would like to introduce you to three, um, short, very briefly to three things that I did. Uh, so far, and you will see that, um, you know, I showed you all these kind of nice, sophisticated things, but what I actually did is uh, very rudimentary in, uh, in comparison to that. So um, we had a research focus on our institute about Andalusia, and I was researching about it in the 7th and 6th century BC. Um, there was an article published by uh, some uh, colleagues from Spain where they actually would wanted to try to figure out what kind of different cultural influences are coming uh, together in Andalusia. And they would have here this kind of matrix. As you can see, there are not a lot of cases. And so, uh, so they have, these are different uh, sites here in Andalusia. And these are particular things that exist. So basically, the sites are cemeteries. And they would um, summarize particular uh, artifact groups, but also customs that can be observed there when you look at the, the burials. And then they would check that here. And based on that, they would make a cluster analysis, yeah, which is grouping the data together. And then uh, if you map that, then you have like this. So these are the sites they uh, would look at. And each symbol stands for a different group uh, related to this. So the thing is, um, uh, cluster analysis is a good one, uh, but you can actually use other methods as well. So I used um, PAST, the one that I showed you. And I made instead a correspondence analysis. OK, I'm not sure what happened here. Anyway. And um, I came to these kind of groups here. Uh, maybe in the next, uh, in our next meeting, I will talk about that a little bit more because you can actually use also correspondence analysis for a lot of data, also for literature stuff. And I don't know, wherever you have um, a big amount of data and you want to explore that, actually, it's a, it's a descriptive statistic here and it groups. Um, based on chi square distance, uh, it, uh, group it, it's grouping these kind of cases together. So um, in a very simplified way, actually that's not 100% true, but everything that is closer together also shares more features with each other or elements with each other. So you can uh, distinguish them some groups. And when I map them, uh, they look like this. And so I came to the result that there is actually, um, that we have like a group that belongs here more to the northwest. Then we have uh, a southwestern group, and then we have a kind of Mediterranean group. So this is the Iberian Peninsula. Here's the Strait of Gibraltar. Here's the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, so we have these different influences here that coming together in this uh, Guadalquivir uh, Valley. Then um, another project, um, which is an ongoing one, Istrian settlements in the Bronze Age. The thing is, so Istria is located here in the uh, northern part of the Adriatic Sea. And in the Bronze Age, we have these kind of fortified settlements. They are very easy to trace because they're always on top of these elevations. And you can see sometimes even the structures are preserved. They are from the old times, uh, some fortification made of dry stone walls. And if you walk on these kind of uh, elevations, you can also find um, uh, artifacts. The problem is that not so many people are excavating there. It's a little bit difficult and a little bit unpleasant uh, to do that. So on the left side, you can see the sites that we know from Istria. So I used here um, QGIS. Uh, and I was not really careful. I didn't cut the, the map out. Yeah, So I should have done that. 
but then you can, for example, so you have all these dots here and each dot is marking a particular site and you want to make something with, it, with that now. You want to understand actually a little bit more about the data. Um, so there's an overlap, for instance. So you can make some heat maps uh, in QGIS. Yeah, so it shows um, places with uh, bigger conglomerations of these points, for instance which is important so we can understand, okay, this is an area. I mean, we can already see that just by the uh, number of points, but still mm, it's, it's another um, confirmation that there is some kind of focus in the settlement activity at this time or in the archeological research. And then you can do this. Um, you can, for instance, then divide the space. Uh, these are artesian polygons. This is also take technique that is used for quite some time. It's not really used anymore because there are better methods actually to do that, um, to tr figure out if there are particular areas, um, you know, of, uh, we usually would uh, try to figure out centrality, if there are central places, which other places are uh, placed around, what is actually the, so to say, the catchment area of each site. Um, it is basically just measuring the distance between two points, like here, and then in the middle, it is uh, drawing a line. Huh? And then depending on how many neighboring points are there, so you would have some area that is um, maybe controlled by this particular settlement in this case. So again, this is not taking into account um, the different um, circumstances on the landscape. Is there a mountain or not? And so, but this is all possible with uh, QGIS. Usually uh, the only problem is that my computational power that I have available is usually not enough for making this for the entire map. So I would have to zoom in and I would have to cut out a smaller region. And the other one, what you see is the intervisibility analysis. So you can actually um, try to figure out which of these different sites were visible. Uh, and I mean, again, actually you would have to zoom in and you have to look at uh, each uh, particular or particular sites more specifically. But here we can see that here is high intervisibility, for instance. Yeah, so you could actually see um, a lot. I mean, there's also higher density of dots, of course. And then, so this is actually just confirming again that we have particular areas that were um, also connected through visibility. Here, for instance, in the middle is a mountainous area. Yeah, and that's why um, these sediments actually couldn't see each other when they existed. And the third example, so this is also an ongoing thing, and um, this is really just work in progress, just to show you uh, uh, centric place theory. I will just jump over this. So I made a map of uh, Jerusalem is the research focus at the moment of our institute, and I try to figure out the role of Jerusalem in this kind of settlement network in the Iron Age in this case. So I have to collect all these different sites here. This is just a small part of that. Yeah. Again, it's just work in progress. Here's Jerusalem, by the way. And then the idea is to figure out how important was Jerusalem actually, uh, aside from maybe this kind of religious and identity focused perspective. So how important was it in the network of these settlements that we have here in the area? And again, we can make these kind of teasing polygons and can, this is a first step maybe to getting some understanding about the centrality of the place and the heat map. Um, here, I'm not really sure about that. I have to apply different methods. So um, Jerusalem is a little bit remotely located, so to say. Uh, other places are better connected. Um, but it is also possible that it actually controlled a bigger cell, maybe. I'm not sure about that. So again, this is all work in progress and just at the beginning, but just to show you what you can do. And by the way, also the map, there are mappings, and you could also add the rivers here. I don't have that here, but this is all possible in QGIS uh, with a few clicks. And not, not too complicated. I mean, you sit usually there and it takes a long time because you make something wrong or the data is not optimal for that. But in the end, you can make these kind of like um, nice maps and also 3D models of the landscape, which is then important for computing, I don't know, low cost paths and something like this uh, quite quickly these days, because also the data for this, um, this is as RTM data yeah, from a um, particular project uh, of a satellite project or data from a satellite mission actually that measured um, particular parts of the earth. Um, and this is available and you can just easily put this in here. Okay, so 
if I have to, I mean, it, it was a lot of information, I guess, and I cannot really make one conclusion here, but, you know, just, I would say archaeology was an early adopter of digital tools because of the big amount of data that we are always generating, if we want or not. Um, many tools that uh, are used in archaeology are not specifically conceptualized for this particular field. So um, maybe also my recommendation for everyone else, you know, it makes sense to look a little bit what other fields are doing. I mean, I would understand that, of course, our meeting here is something like this already, right? Or but just sur surfing around a little bit, um, looking for inspiration and tools in other research fields is a valuable thing. You can find something that you can use definitely. And yeah, so my projects at the moment are quite rudimentary, but uh, it is being planned to go more into depth with the ongoing projects. And of course, I will. I hope that I will have the opportunity to report about that then a little bit more in detail. So that's it for uh, my presentation. Thanks a lot for your attention. And of course, I'm more than happy to get uh, any kind of um, recommendation, comments, and also questions. Thanks a lot. All right. Yeah. Yeah, June. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation, Professor Miller. Uh, I, if you maybe if you mentioned I, uh, I don't get I don't get maybe my my uh, my miss uh, learning. Uh, so uh, one more time, uh, I uh, get the uh, uh, I I have a question. Uh, how to get the uh, data, uh, especially spatial data? Where, yeah. where, where, where did you get? Yeah, okay. So there is, um, for instance, there's a, the website from the US government where there is this NASA data. There are different kind of, uh, there, you know, from different satellite projects that were there, which kind of uh, scanned the earth and you have different resolutions. The best thing I think is the 30 meters SRTM 30. You also have 60, which is then of course uh, the, the resolution is a bit, little bit rougher, but that's also maybe um, uh, not too bad if you have like bigger areas you would look at and you can get this data for free. Yeah, at particular websites and also QGIS I think has a plugin now where you can just um, download that. It which, comes which, a, which, which format? Um, it is different kind of formats. It's a GeoTIFF, for instance. So this is what I'm using, GeoTIFF, uh, where you have like um, this, uh, also the, the data about the elevation. And then you have an elevation map um, or the elevation data comes inside. You can, you have, you can download actually all, uh, always just particular squares uh, because um, I don't know for specifically determining which area you're interested in because the data can be really big. I think you can also download maybe everything at once. Um, so if you're interested, I can give you the, 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 the website uh, address. Yeah, and I think you have to register there, but that's it, it's, it's not a big deal. Uh, so they don't want anything else. We just say, I use this data for scientific academic purposes, and then you can just download that. Okay, send me. I will send you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Daniel. Thank you for your presentation. Something that was interesting for me was the idea of archaeology as an early ad adopter of digital uh, approach. For this reason, I would like to ask, how can you imagine the difference between digital archaeology and digital humanities in archaeology? Do you think that are they different or that maybe digital humanities is only a new word for digital archaeology? Yeah, I would say it's a more a kind of, it's, it's a new word, a new term that came up. I don't know when, maybe like 10 years ago or so, uh, uh, or maybe a little bit earlier. And um, um, it would actually promote a lot of things that were al already quite um, familiar to archaeologists, I would say. Yeah? For example, using, I don't know, GIS uh, for finding, for figuring stuff out and so on and so on. For archaeologists, yeah, of course, making maps, you know, and trying to find distances and uh, analyzing that and also using databases to process the data in such a way that you can also maybe share it easier, that you can also... Uh, uh, use it in a statistical way and so so 
it is, I mean, there is a, like, as I said, her digital archaeology, and of course, people would understand it as part of the digital humanities in some way. But um, for me, it was also interesting to see the discussion, uh, like at our institute and in Korea, and so how that when digital humanities became very big, and so and uh, it's interesting for me because a lot of these methods and so look familiar to me because um, archaeology would use that maybe from a different, uh, like with a different motivation also, but in the end. Um, it comes together and as i said i can just profit from that if from other fields colleagues are getting into those people who are more knowledgeable than i am uh, i am and uh, you know providing all these kind of cool tools that i can use then for my purposes thank you yeah okay any other questions or comments Hi, Professor Miller. Thanks Hi. for your nice talk. And uh, yeah, uh, just uh, following up on what uh, Danielle said about uh, your methodology and uh, as a you know uh, academic field of um, archaeology. So in a way, uh, you know, um, anthropology, archaeology uh, kind of splits. So the you know uh, until late nineteenth century, even beginning with. 20th century, a lot of hypotheses and then sort of like humanistic studies. And then after that, there's a term that, you know, uh, becomes scientific studies because uh, data-driven or evidence-driven uh, uh, studies. Uh, but in terms of um, just talk, thinking about, um, you know, reorientation of humanity through digital humanity, I mean, we are... Um, attempting to correct those kinds of, you know, hypotheses or things uh, that we kind of taken uh, taken taken them them granted, and now with the uh, data and and uh, uh, visualization of uh, information, we try to correct ourselves in some ways, right? So. Uh, do you think even now, you know, after about 100 or so years of uh, the scientific type of uh, uh, archaeology, is there any kind of self-reflection of archaeological study and that they're trying to do some rather corrective, but trying to, you know, fix things that, that was popular belief or uh, wrongly hypothesized and then with, with you know, these studies that you have shown different data and some data are there but you cannot kind of draw any kind of conclusion out of it because for the studies needed to be done and so forth so just want to learn from you know the your uh, uh, um, expertise and knowledge in archaeology that said is there any kind of attempt to, to correct uh, uh, past studies or past uh, hypotheses through these uh, evidences? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, uh, good question. I mean, uh, it starts really already uh, with the, the division of anthropology and archaeology uh, in, um, I think, in the US or in English, like in the Anglophone sphere, it is um, archaeology and anthropology are much closer together. If you look in Germany, these are really kind of separated disciplines. And uh, there's sometimes also, there's problems to communicate with each other yeah, because uh, what we're doing can be very different. I mean, archeologists, they cannot really um, uh, go to a site and can observe people, right? And can talk with them in some way. And anthropologists, I mean, it exists now, there was this material turn and everything, right? But a lot of anthropologists were not necessarily very interested, even though in the history of anthropology that played a role, right, in material culture. So, so like, okay, why should I look at some object and try to figure out if this is telling me something about like the social relations of people because I just can go there and I can see it, right? And I can talk with them about that. So uh, I don't consider that very important. Of course, that changed, right? And I think uh, specifically in the last maybe two decades or three decades, I guess, oh my God, time is really flying a lot, right? Um, so I would actually argue that uh, yes, there is, uh, there is a lot of uh, dialogue and uh, also the insight that uh, 
you know that knowledge is coming from both sides and so and also of course uh, earlier um, attempts to do something and to use data in a specific way and also to abuse actually data. Yeah? Archaeology uh, was very good in um, providing kind of justification specifically in Germany, by the way, yeah, for political decision making. And we can see that this plays a role, right? History, uh, some people say history is not important at all, but we can see re uh, in recent developments in Europe, for instance, yeah, that how maybe some weird perspective on history is being used to make um, like brutal politics. And uh, or politics is actually the wrong word. Uh, war, you know, to wage a war uh, based on whatever kind of assumptions from the from the history. And we had that also in archaeology. That archaeology provided kind of like the justification for, for example, for the Nazi regime. Yeah. So they focused a lot on archaeology. They wanted to prove uh, that their weird theories about race uh, are true, and that, for instance, the space in the eastern part, yeah, this kind of like Lebensraum, as they would call it, um, space for living that this actually belonged from the very beginnings actually to the, I don't know, to, to the German sphere or like to the Aryan, Northern Aryan sphere or something like that. And um, I, I would say you know, in, some, in some countries, archeology span learned about it, specifically in Germany, we don't like to do that anymore to, uh, we don't make it a lot ethnic uh, connections with material culture, even though it exists kind of, yeah, but there's a lot of discussion about it in other countries, I have to say, this is still quite a big thing uh, to believe that uh, you have the distribution of particular artifacts and types. And then, uh, OK, um, so that means like our ancestors lived in this area and so on. But anthropology actually gives us very, very good insights that, of course, material culture using it is, has nothing to do with ethnic identity. And that also ethnic identity is a very fluid thing, right? So people can identify maybe, I don't know, at one point of time with a specific ethnic group and that can change over their life so they might you know just flip around and uh, i don't know uh, belong to this group and that group and in the end you cannot really you know so it's also a question what is it worth in the end so to talk about that uh, but yes so exactly what you said there is corrections are being made and there is some dialogue and it's getting stronger more insight that this is very important um, generally i would say in archaeology um, adopting, I mean, we are early adopter when it comes to these kind of digital tools, but when it comes to discussions and other fields, I would say uh, archaeology in many cases is hanging behind a little bit, specifically in Germany, it's not like this anymore, but reflections about, okay, uh, you know, what is going on, what is the newest development in uh, anthropology or in ethnology, as we would call it huh, in Germany. So you can see that there's sometimes a gap of like 10 or 15 years until the news are trickling into the field of archaeology. Um, maybe, I don't know, we are dealing with old stuff, right? So maybe we are a little bit more conservative also than in our approaches. And some of these approaches, I mean, they are old, but they are working, right? And they produce some kind of uh, results. The question is always just how to interpret them and uh, how to what do we make out of them in the end right to recognize okay we cannot say anything about it or just uh, be able to recognize no this is something really great and it can also contribute of course to the discussion in other fields yeah all right other questions or comments i guess we have like maybe two or three minutes If not, that's also fine, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much anyway for, for listening. And uh, so if you have any questions about like these uh, tools that I showed you, the software and so, then please let me know. Of course, I will uh, give you the links where you can download it and can see for yourself if this is maybe something that could be useful in your work or not. Thank you very much.